Can you describe fundamentally how an index fund works? For somebody who is watching and owns a Vanguard index fund, how's the, how does the process work behind the scenes? Is it, is it um, five robots, three, <laughs> three monkeys, and, uh, and a bunch of data? Or are there human choices that are going into the index? Well, first, you can, you can match the index in a very casual way. Just, I mean, by, if, if um, I don't know, Microsoft is 2% of the index, you just put 2% of the portfolio in Microsoft. Uh, pretty, and, and then the same thing is true of every other fund. Not very complicated. And if you don't do it with great professional skill, all kinds of quantitative support, you will do a perfectly good job, but not a perfect traffic tracking job. In the long run, you'll match the index, but you might beat the index by 50 basis points, half of 1% in a year, mm -hmm. and lose to it by half a percent in another year. The tolerance are very small. Mm -hmm. But and people like to see, or investors like to see, a tight tracking. And so you do all these quantitative things. They're, they're definitely called for, called for you know, quantitative mathematical skills, uh, particularly when they're additions to the index or subtractions. That happens more in the Standard & Poor's 500 than in the total stock market. Uh, but um, it's really, it's a very simple thing conceptually, but to do it with something that approaches perfection is just what you say. A lot of quantitative uh, people hidden behind the hidden behind the walls. If we, if we take the concept of too big to succeed and apply it to capitalization weighted index fund, isn't that a bad idea? Wouldn't it be better to set the index fund up on a different set of criteria rather than weighting it by capitalization? Aren't we buying the largest companies and the most successful companies which have the smallest future market opportunity and, and underweighting the small, potentially upstart, disruptive future vanguards? Well, you're saying that cap weighting indexes are, give you a flawed index, in effect. And uh, I guess my first comment would be, uh, since such an index beats the heck out of money managers, uh, what kind of trouble would, be, would we be in if, they, if there were a perfect index? <laughs> so, uh, and, and then I'd also say, much more importantly than that, and that is, if the idea of indexing, as Paul Samuelson described it when he wrote the foreword to my first book, uh, was you will uh, get better returns than your neighbors and sleep better than your neighbors. And your neighbors own the capitalization weighted index. Now, will a value weighted index do better? Will a dividend weighted index do better? Probably it will do better some of the time. I do not believe it will do better in the long run. That remains to be seen. But when you think about it, uh, if, let's say, fundamental indexing, whatever that means exactly, but a weighting by some company, uh, corporation data rather than by market price, still owns essentially all the stocks that the S&P 500 owns, which is somewhat different weights. Not huge, but somewhat different weights. So uh, they may do better, they may do worse. But if they continue to do better, well, what will happen? Everybody will take their money out of the market-weighted index and put it into the value-weighted index, and then the opportunity will vanish. Hmm. That's the way the markets work. Hmm. I don't think it's going to work, hmm. and I don't think that it's worthwhile to add that risk. You know, I know what I can get. I can do better than my neighbors. Hmm. I can own the whole market. That's a little beyond the S&P, but it's a perfectly way, a good way of looking at it. Uh, do better than my neighbors, and should I give that, let's call it certainty of relative return, up for the uncertainty of whether one of these schemes that's out there, equal weighting, value weighting, dividend weighting, fundamental <laughs> weighting, all kinds of weighting. I kind of feel like equal weighting is not, w would, be a, would be a smart, but I guess time will tell whether that Well, it, it works sometimes. We have yeah. data going back forever, but don't let the past data impress you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when people start actually doing these things, you know this from your own experience, that what comes out of the lab is seldom represent, reflected in the real world. <laughs> How many mutual funds of, a, of an index variety, let's say somebody's indexing entirely, um, how many funds should they own as an individual? What's too many and what's too few? Well, you can certainly do it with one. Mm -hmm. And that would be something like the Vanguard Balanced Index Fund. Mm -hmm. It's 60% uh, total stock market, 40% mm -hmm. total bond market, both US. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. So a, a person out there could simplify their lives, make sure they're paying off all their high interest debt, it's gone. They're saving a portion of their salary each year, and they're putting it all in the Vanguard Balanced, balanced Index Fund. Right. And that three-step approach 
is going to improve the outcomes for the majority of investors out there, number one, and you think it's completely um, reasonable to put it all in a single fund. Well, I, there are obviously a lot of nuances here, and one of them is uh, if you're younger, I would think you'd want to be 80 or 85 percent equities. Okay, yeah. And if you're older, I would think, although interest rates are so terrible today, you have to rethink all these things mm -hmm. as the markets change. Mm -hmm. But older, maybe 25 percent mm -hmm. uh, equities and 75 percent bonds, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are this kind of an age-based. Your bond position should equal your age, mm -hmm. but that's a rule of thumb. And interestingly enough, it shows a gap in the kind of the way these target date funds are, that are very popular today are structured because they ignore the fact that 85% of their shareholders have Social Security. Mm -hmm. And a Social Security, when you begin it, has a capitalized value of maybe the stream of future payments you will get is capitalized at around, let me say, $350,000. Mm -hmm. If you have $350,000 totally invested in an equity index fund, you're 50 50. Mm -hmm. now, you don't look at it that way, mm -hmm. uh, and your behavior mm -hmm. may get you in trouble that way because I got too much in stocks. Mm -hmm. But what people should be doing, honestly, Tom, is stop looking at the silly stock market every day and look at the cash flow they get. And in, in, in a uh, Social Security, those payments are going to continue. They're going to grow with the cost of living. Uh, I'm, I'm certain, as certain as I can be, the Social Security will be repaired simply because it has to be. And I, I don't think its future is in doubt. Mm. If we can just wake up a few of those people down in the nation's capital. Mm. And uh, th for stocks, uh, you probably want to look at more of a dividend bias. You could buy a high yield dividend index instead of the total stock market index if capital flows. Mm. And that dividend, if you look at the stream of dividends, it makes the stock market look violently volatile. The dividend stream goes up, up, up. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is there have only been two significant dividend cuts uh, since 1925. Mm -hmm. One was in 2932, and the other was a few years ago, 2007, 2009, when all the financial companies pretty much eliminated their dividends. Mm -hmm. We've already recovered from that. Mm -hmm. That's over. We're on the S&P, mm -hmm. Standard & Poor's Index is, is paying more dividend now than it was before the drop. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, all of these things are uh, clear in the past, and in a lot of ways that doesn't matter. But if you assume that American business grows, that America grows, uh, that the dividend stream will keep going up. And as, as uh, people ask all the time, uh, corporations have got huge amounts of cash, mm -hmm. so dividends should not be uh, jeopardized, absent some real problem in the, in the world and in the economy. And people should be aware of that. You know, there's, nothing is a lead pipe cinch in this world, but you have, <laughs> actually, it's sort of amusing. You have a couple of big risks out there. Um, you know, you know about the economy, you know about it, uh, international kind of hanging on by its own. You know about the, do do the dollar, you know about the Federal Reserve buying all those securities and trying to bid the prices up of, of assets, not a particularly wise move. And uh, you have to assess those risks and try to make some kind of a judgment, however difficult about um, how they come out. But you also have to realize a couple of things. Well, that's the second set of risks is really the incomprehensible risks, like nuclear warfare mm -hmm. or a, a, a meteor. A meteorite hits mm -hmm. the US. Mm -hmm. Well, Or the, robots, robots, robots begin anything. to control our society. It, 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 it yeah. won't matter whether you have stocks or bonds or anything else. Mm -hmm. so, club, yeah. you'll need a club. Yeah, you just, just yeah. a club. So there are all kinds of big and small risks. Yeah. But as I've often said, um, you know, we're sitting here knowing where the world is going into a, the hell in a handbasket. Uh, but people have been worried about that since the beginning. The knowns are not the, yeah, the, the known fears are not the ones to yeah. really, really fear. And so, so are you, and by the way, Jack, I, I truly can't believe that you're 84 years old. Are you 84% in bonds? Uh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. So you're violating your advice. Well, yeah, actually, I'm kidding. Well, to be honest, by rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah. And of course, at 84, your Social Security doesn't have a capitalized value of $350,000 either. <laughs> I, like, I like the next check to come in. My wife doesn't think we should take the checks, but you know, we postponed them until we were 70. And we really got a nice, I can live on what I get from Social Security, because mm -hmm. <laughs> we live in a fairly modest way, mod well, modest by the standards of, very modest compared by the standards of what you see in the financial world mm -hmm. and corporate world. But uh, pretty, pretty nice compared to the 
typical American mm -hmm. worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it, you, know, you start with a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you work back for... And you work back and then you got to think about, and I don't know, I haven't figured out, Tom, how to do it, but when I first introduced this rule, I can remember back in 1999 at Morningstar, uh, I told them that I was uh, reducing my uh, equity position from about 75 percent of, of my holdings to, I think, 30 percent of my holdings uh, because the stock market was selling at 35 times earnings and the bond market was yielding 7 percent. And I looked at the transcript a while back and I said, you know, honestly, when I look at the math, I don't see why anybody hold, why I would hold any stocks at all, mm -hmm. because at 30 times, 35 times earnings, mm -hmm. stocks were not going to give you a 7 percent return mm -hmm. in the first decade mm -hmm. of the 20th century. But now you look at the numbers and you're not really sure what to do about them. Well, but now, you know, my own position is that stocks are more or less fairly valued, probably a little on the high side, but, you know, more like, depending on whose number you're using, 15 to 17 times earnings, maybe 18 times earnings. Mm -hmm. It's a long way from 35, half. And bonds are not yielding seven, they're yielding, depending on what you want to look at, 3%, 2.5%, mm -hmm. 3.5%, depending on corporate government mix, maturities and th things of that nature. So you have to think a little bit differently. But I have not done anything about that. Mm -hmm. I, am, I don't change my portfolio. Mm -hmm. 